So uh, it's Mother's Day, and uh, one of the things I thought for me as a preacher, the last thing I needed to do was to stand up here and try to mansplain what it means to be a mom. You know, so there's enough of that kind of stuff that goes on in life. And so I've invited four different ladies to come up and share different perspectives of motherhood. You know, it's impossible to think of every perspective of motherhood. And so there's so many different moms and types of moms and different things that you go through. And uh, so first, we say thank you. And the second thing is uh, I have hopes for today uh, that this is not just for moms. You're going to hear women talk about issues of parenting and, and grandmothering from the perspective of a woman. But as we wrap this all up later in the service, I'm hoping what you'll grasp is the human existence and experience and the fact that all of us go through many of the same struggles. A lot of the faces up here you've seen doing different things. Uh, and you re recognize them, you watch them walk into church, and if you're anything like me, before I became a follower of Christ, uh, I would go to church, and I was an adult, and go to church, and I'd see all these perfect families walking in the building, and all these people that had life all together, and everything happened the way they wanted, and then something happened. I became a preacher, and I got to know those perfect families, and they weren't so perfect. Amen. You know, their families looked a lot like mine. And they went through some of the same struggles that I go through. And so that's going to be the hope of what we uh, have taken place. Let me pray for us, and then I'll sit down and we'll begin. Father, we thank you so much for your love and grace. We thank you for how you've cared for us and you've provided for us. We thank you, God, that we get to sing songs of worship to you today. We thank you we can gather together in freedom to worship you. God, may you be with this service. May your spirit guide our time together. And most importantly, may we sense you in our midst. We love you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So what I thought we'd do is we'd just start with the introductions. So, Ms. Wilma, do you want to start? And we'll just go down the line. Uh, my name is Wilma Myers, and I'm the grandmother of the day. I'm Marissa Prouty. I'm mom to three kids, Isaac, Elena, and Clara, and I'm representing preschool age moms. And I'm... Um, I'm Teresa Miller. Um, I have a 17-year-old boy and a 15-year-old girl, so I represent just the, the moms of the moment. My name is Christine, oopsie. Yeah, it's, it's on. on. Okay, whoa, that's loud. Uh, my name is Christine Barnes, and I have three grown children, so I am the newly empty-nested mom. All right, so. I, I'm turning my microphone off because of interference, so I've got to remember to keep doing that back and forth. So one of the things, I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. I've got some questions. They've had time to think through these and pray about them. And so the first passage of Scripture I want to read is found in Proverbs. It's verses 30 and 31. It says this, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. And one of the aspects of this is, uh, is your relationship with Christ and building into that relationship with Christ. And so questions, like uh, how do you focus on building your relationship with Christ? What are some of the struggles? that you've had and uh, some of the ways that you've done that. So, Marissa, we'll start with you. Um, it's changed a lot since I've had kids just because there's not as much free, uninterrupted time. Um, somebody's always needing something or interrupting me. Um, so I just try and take it moment by moment. Um, worship songs in the car, in the walk while I'm around the house. Um, if I have a thought pop into my head or a situation pop into my head, I pray about it right then before I forget or lose the opportunity. Um, and just short journaling or devotional times, usually once the kids are in bed, if I am not busy doing something else. Um, but mostly just through conversations with the kids, um, talking about everyday situations that we're going through, um, when we mess up, when I mess up, when they mess up, um, talking about how we're not perfect, and that's why we need Christ in our life. So um, one of the ways, I, I, I have a tendency to feel like I failed kindergarten. Um, it makes me laugh because relationships are hard for me because I think the good ones I've seen are very selfless, and I have a tendency to be a little meanness. Um, so... I, I talk to God a lot every day, but it's more like chats. Um, I lost my dad when I was 21, but one of the things I did with him is he was a machinist and he would wake up real early in the morning and go to work. And I was the kid he woke up to kind of wake up the family. And so we would sit there and talk about the moment. And I think I, I use that relationship that I learned with my dad 
I use that with Christ. And so a lot of times I just have small chats with Christ and I, I talk about the moment. And there's a lot of times I have the big prayers and future prayers and, and you know, the moment that we need to have those. But my, my prayer life is normally in those small chats. I don't journal, I don't have a set routine. I have chats that are a lot about being desperate and wanting God in that moment and, and being there in that moment. Uh, for me, it's uh, spending personal time in prayer and reading God's word. There is absolutely nothing that replaces that in our lives. You can open God's word and there will always be something. Even if you don't understand what you're reading at the time, God will reveal something to you. Uh, when I was young and struggling, I opened my little... I had, a, as a small child, I had a little um, Gideon New Testament, and I can still to this day remember not just the chapter and verse, Hebrews 11, chapter 1, but the page number. And so when I was a kid, I'd be wandering around, be like, okay, Hebrews 11, 393, Hebrews 11, page 393. And it was the, the verse that I had read talking about how we have hope, even though we can't see what's going on, and even though we don't see God's face, we can have hope through faith that he is real and that he is going to take care of us. Uh, I think my relationship with the Father really grows when I with Christine, when you open up the Word. Um, I have, um, if you come to my house in the morning, I turn on the radio, it's either Moody or Family Life, and it's on all day. I've been in some of the most wonderful Bible studies in this church and the preaching on Sunday and things, but there is nothing like opening up that word of God and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. That's when my relationship grows with the Father. I remember asking my boys as they were growing up, what kind of woman do you want to marry? So they would give me advice, and it says, uh, so, well, things they would say, you know, the answers. And of course, they were good-looking young ladies, and other aspects that went along with that. And one of the questions I asked them after that, I'd let them explain, and, and I'd say to them, okay, now, are you the kind of guy that deserves that kind of girl? You know, and so one of the aspects that we look at life today is, is marriage and family is under attack. And um, so, actually, Proverbs says, uh, verse, uh, chapter uh, 31, verses 10 and 11. An excellent wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. And so uh, I, I ask these ladies to think about this, uh, um, uh, this question. What do you hope to teach your children uh, about marriage and family? For instance, I mean, what do you want your daughters to see? What do you want your sons to see? Uh, and so these are, that's the, the, the thought behind this question. And we'll let Miss Wilma start this one. I'm uh, coming at it so you know what my advice is a little bit different. Uh, my daughter and her husband have been married 30 years. And my son and his wife have been married over 20 years. And I have three grandsons who are married. So as I thought about this question and prayed about it, this would be my advice. Remember, the enemy wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your family because this is the heart of God. You read in Scripture, and he wants to destroy it. And if I could, I would get every family member to uh, memorize this verse. It's one of my favorites. It's from, I'm reading from the NIV version, and it is found in Proverbs 4.23, and it says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is a wellspring of life. It's your heart, and it's keeping it right with the Father. So many things out there want to pull at the marriage and the family, and God wants us together. Um, I had said first service that my version of this is going to be a little bit more worldly, but Pastor Larry will correct it again, I'm sure. Um, so <laughs> I'll just roll... Um, but I had said, I would tell my kids, don't ever, ever give up. Every spouse, whether it's a future husband or a future wife, is going to be flawed. You're dating this person and you're only seeing the very best of them. Make sure that they love Jesus Christ first and foremost. 
you keep him first in your relationship and most everything else is just going to be small bumps in the road and you <laughs> you can't marry somebody and expect that they're going to be perfect or expect that well they've got these little flaws but once we're married I'm going to change them I'll fix them um, no you're not <laughs> news flash no you're not so what I would say to every wife especially, husbands too, but especially to, to our wives, and I told my girls this, don't nag your husband. Zero, I heard that, John. I can count on the number of one hands. I was joking for a second. I said, oh, wait, zero, the times that it does any good. All it does is damage your relationship. So do not nag your husband. If your spouse has a problem, husband, wife, God knows, and God knows them better than you. So if your spouse has a significant problem, a genuine issue, pray for them. Pray for them. Don't ever give up. And want for your spouse what God's will is for their life. And so I hope that my children end up marrying somebody that makes them feel loved and supported and respected and helps build their faith. Um, I hope we can teach our kids a lot about marriage, um, but some of the most important ones, anybody can get married, um, but you have to make the intentional choice to seek the covenant marriage that God designed. Um, that's the way he intended it, and I feel that that helps us to better understand our relationship with God. And it's of utmost importance that you keep God at the center of your marriage. Um, he's the one that's going to support you and get you through all the troubles. Um, and I hope that our kids can learn what love and respect look like in action day to day in our lives. And that they continually need to work on strengthening that relationship. It's not a, okay, we're married, it's smooth sailing from here. You have to make the choice to continue to work on it and continue to grow closer together and closer to God. Um, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy, but it's 100% worth it. So many people um, know the Deuteronomy 6.5, and it says, Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. But if you keep reading verse 6 and 7, <clears throat> it says, These commandments I give to you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. So we, we, I, have this, I have this process where if you get in the Jeep, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about God and we're going to talk about your relationship. Um, my kids and my husband, they both know this. They all know this. And even some of our unsuspecting teens uh, who have been given a ride home, have gotten involved in this. I control where the car stops, and I control the radio, so we're going to talk. So in these talks, we cover everything. We not only cover love, and love is, and, and what love is defined by the Bible in 1 Corinthians 13, but what it looks like to love your neighbor. And, and I've always wanted my kids to be good, godly kids, and I've told them that that I want them to grow into that. But I had to tell them what it looked like too. And so again, if we kind of go back to love and what love is, then I want them to take that perspective um, into their family and their marriage. You did already answer that because I was reminded again that what I heard most is that Matt has a lot of flaws. That's one that says. <laughs> It makes sense. I mean, it makes sense to me every time. And think about this, though. Seriously, how often can I get up here as a preacher and I can say some of the same things that these ladies have said? Your marriage is being fought for, right? There, there's a battle that's going on to keep that protected. It's a covenant relationship. Love is the key of that aspect. Never give up on that aspect of, of marriage. And these are things that we're teaching our kids. I mean, they're looking in. You know, so they, they mock us. They, mo they, they do the same things we say. They have the same phrases. Their body expressions are much, much like ours. I look at my youngest son, CJ, sometimes and feel like I'm looking in the mirror, uh, watching him and just his expressions of life. And, and, and so what we teach our kids about marriage is key in, in, in a relationship with them because, uh, quite frankly, aside from a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's the most important relationship that any of us are ever going to have. 
The second passage, Jason read it, so I won't reread it, but it's all about surrendering your children to the Lord. Right? Remember, Hannah prayed. I, I love that story. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 1, so go back and read it if you're not familiar with it. A few verses. She needed a child or wanted a child, and she prayed, and uh, she's praying at the temple court, and they thought she was drunk, and, and, and so Eli comes out and says, oh, what's the matter with you? So I just, no, I'm not drunk. I'm praying for a kid. And, and so in that, uh, God blesses her and answers that prayer for a kid, and that kid is Samuel. And, and as Samuel is weaned off of uh, breastfeeding and brought into that little point of being a little child, still she brings him and she surrenders him to the Lord and he spends the rest of his life in the temple serving the Lord. And so the question is this, is, is um, have, how have you surrendered your children to the Lord? And, and, and what's been the toughest challenge in doing so? Fear and, and reward? So what, what have been all those things? And so, um, Teresa, will you start that one? Sure. <coughs> so I... I've had to surrender my children in different ways at different times. Um, Kate was a touch and go pregnancy from the time we found out I was pregnant with her at eight weeks. She was born uh, three months early, so she was a preemie. And JJ, we prayed for for eight years. So God and I have talked about the kids daily and for a very long time from the very beginning. So as I grow in my own personal faith, I found that God loves me and that I'm his child and I hold tight to the fact that that God loves me so much so much that he sent his son to die for me and as a mom I get that I get how much he had to love me to let that happen John and Kate they have my heart but in comparison to how much God loves them wow I can't I can't even imagine his love for them if my heart wants to explode. So I put that into comparison, and I lean in to let God and let go. It's hard because I'm a planner. I have a path. I see a path. I go down the path. I get things accomplished. I like that. But I want to grow kids that love the Lord. So I don't get to create their path. I get to discern and understand and try and see what God is doing and support it. But there's a part that hurts. God's success isn't what I would define as success. It might be, but it might not be. But I don't get to, I don't get to be part of that plan. So I want for them only godly success. And I know that he wants that because they're his children too. Um, our kids are small now, so we have a lot more say of what they're exposed to, what they're involved in, uh, but we know the time is coming when they're grown and have their own independence and get to make all those choices themselves. So our goal right now is to help them build that foundation in Christ so that as they do grow and get that independence, they have that foundation that they can continue to build on um, and just keep them strong. Um, the fear is knowing that I don't have control, um, and I like having control, um, but also knowing that they're going to face pain and trials, and I can't do a single thing to stop it. Um, all I can do is walk through life with them. But uh, the reward is knowing that God's plan for them is far greater than anything I can ever imagine. Well, as far as... Uh turning our kids over to the Lord, oh boy, we turn our kids over and over and over, right, and re-over. Um, I tend to be a very fearful person. A very, I'm, a, I'm very much a worrier, especially when it comes to kids. Um, my oldest daughter has Asperger's. Uh, my youngest son, of course, everybody knows Timmy, or at least most everybody knows Timmy. Um, and <laughs> if you don't, you will. Um, so, but my, my fear, um, one of my biggest fears was trusting the kids, letting them go to public school. Um, I'm very old fashioned. I believe that the husband is the head of the household and that he needs, I, I trust him through God's Holy Spirit to make the decisions in our household. And I wanted to homeschool. I was going to homeschool the kids. Um, and I'm very strong willed. God bless Matthew. So, but he's very peaceful. He's just like, no, 
I think that I think they need to go to public school. I just I really feel strongly that they need to go to public school. And I was just oh, really. <laughs> but uh, I just said, okay, well, I'm going to let you make that, you know, decision, and um, I'm just going to ask for God to, you're just going to have to be patient with me because I don't feel good about it, but, and, but God did give me peace about it eventually. Um, and they had some really great teachers along the way who have been such a profound blessing to them, and Mrs. Ray is one of them. She's in the room today. Um, but... Uh, <sighs> My biggest fear is that the, the evil in this world would speak louder than the Holy Spirit in their lives and would break them. And in this culture and day and age that we live on where there are so many sinful, unholy things that are being shoved down our kids' throats, you step into a public school for five minutes and you'll see it. And I'm not just talking about the cussing and the swearing, I'm talking about, you know, like the gender confusion and all of the, you know, obviously biblically untrue things that are just being shoved down their throats as cultural norms. The world is scary, absolutely scary. And so we turn our kids over to God, and they move out, and then you're still scared for them <laughs> because you can't control what happens to them in, out in the real world. But God loves our kids more than we do. As Teresa said, if we love our kids and we worry about our kids, how much more does our Heavenly Father, who sacrificed his son, we can trust Jesus. We can trust God because he loves our kids so much more than we do. Um, and this thing of surrender, I think is the hardest thing for me. I read with Christine over and over again. I've surrendered them, and then I've unsurrendered. I don't know if that's a word or not, but I've taken them back up again. And over the years, it, it really is. It's difficult to leave your children with the Lord. Isn't that something when you put it like that? The, the, the God who loves them and made them and died for them, and you think you have a better plan. Boy, when you put it like that, you know, it kind of makes you ashamed to, to not just surrender. And, and really, I think the thing is, you just have to surrender and leave it there. Just let God do what God can do best. I don't know why I'm having a hard time remembering this service. You did all right the first time. Yeah, I did. I did much better the first service remembering all that. Are you sure you talked already? Because this is so... It's funny thinking through this. So, you know, we, we met last week. The, us three met last week, and then Miss Wilma came into my office uh, later in the week to talk about this, and she cleaned it up for you guys. So it's not like she was cussing like a sailor in my office, but one thing she did say is she's talked about watching her kids be hurt, right? And we talked about this, and when you have to surrender them to the Lord, you have to let them go through hurt that you can't fix anymore, right? But I did to get this picked up, pick up this from Miss Wilma, that if you hurt one of her kids and she's around, she just might punch you in the mouth. So, so, and uh, talk, talk about something that's hard to do, really. You think through this, right? And we have all these plans and hopes for our kids, right? Especially when they're coming into the world, right? We, our our uh, oldest son, Preston, uh, his second son was just born a couple of days ago. And so you got this sweet little baby boy that's just beautiful. And, you know, you hold him and you pray for him and all these hopes that are going along with him. It kind of got me thinking about um, uh, uh, the mother of Jesus, Mary. And in chapter 1 of, verse, of Luke, of verse 28, it says, And Mary said, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And, and the angel departed from her. We know the context of that is that the angel came to her and promised her that she was going to have a son and the son was going to be the savior of the world. And, and right in that moment, and she's like, man, this is just amazingly great. And, and you think about it from a worldly perspective, of course she would say, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as the Lord has said. And just like holding that little baby in your hands and all the hopes and dreams and everything that goes along with that, something happens as babies grow up. Pain comes in. Right? Sometimes that pain is something that we cause as parents. Sometimes our kids bring pain into our lives, and all, all that stuff happens. And, and I thought about the mother of Jesus and wondered at that moment when she said, I'm the Lord's servant, may it be to me as you have said. There's no way that she could have thought about this next, these next verse, verses. John chapter 19, 
verse, uh, verses 25 through 27. But standing by the cross uh, of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sisters, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So there's a lot of pain that goes along with being a parent or a mom. And so one of the things I ask them to prepare for is this, is what's been the greatest source of pain in your life as a mom? How has God carried you through that pain? And what's something you've learned about yourself? So Christine, we'll let you start this one. You made me start flat first, sir. He's mean. <laughs> he looks innocent. He's mean. I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so... The greatest source of pain for me uh, as a mom, and I think it's true of all of us as moms, is our complete helplessness when it comes to watching our children suffer. You can't change it. You can't stop it. You can't fix it. Uh, the two examples that I gave for service that were absolutely heart-wrenching for me were... Uh, my son, when he was a year old, he burned up with fever for two days. And when he came out of that fever, he was a, a staring, empty, nonverbal little shell. That was hard. Uh, and I wouldn't hear his voice again for a couple of years after that. And God bless him, he hasn't shut up since. <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it. And then the other time was um, when um, the more, we got a call in the middle of the night that our daughter's 17-year-old uh, sweetheart had died in a house fire. Having to tell your 16-year-old daughter that the young man that she was planning, they were just starting to make plans. You know, he was talking to Matt, and I'm going to go into the Air Force just like you did, Mr. Matt, and I'm going to take good care of Emily, and having to tell your 16-year-old daughter that he died in a house fire, and hearing her screams, I can still hear him. You can't fix it. You can't take it away. But God knows. He sees the beginning from the end. God knew when I was told when Timothy was two years old, well, you should probably institutionalize him because he's never going to talk, never going to know who you are, never going to care that you love him and you have two daughters to raise. Well, God has other plans. Even when things look hopeless, even when you feel like your heart's been ripped out of your chest, God has a plan. Yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my daughter is a grandma, and my son has older teenagers, uh, three older children. And even though they are that age in life, uh, I've seen them go through some struggles some trials and some heartaches. And you know what? You're still a mom. Those feelings of when they're little and you can take everything and make it good, they're all there. Everybody, they never go away. It don't matter. So if you're hoping that someday it changes, it doesn't. And I'll just tell you that right up front. And, and I've seen them. And, and I've seen them had to work through situations. And how I think God carried me through is I prayed for them. And I started praying that God would, they would see, that they would see God in this trial. And when the trial was over, that they would see his faithfulness and that their faith would be stronger in who he was and what he can do in their lives. Um, but you will, you, we will always have those mom's feelings. It doesn't matter how old your children get. Sorry. <laughs> They're there. I could talk about a lot of the private moments that we have struggled through in our home. Ones very likely that are happening in yours. There's not very much that's happened 
in your home that hasn't happened in ours. But those are private for us. But know that we have been through them. God has brought our children through them. He's brought our family through them. But he's also brought children through our home to help through those moments too. But the greatest pain, um, kind of like as Christine was saying, is that in today's world, just for being a Christian and following their, their faith, they would see kids that they've been friends with since kindergarten slide away. They would see a godly trait mocked or ridiculed by the, by the people they call friends. And one of the harder parts is I don't get to be part of their personal relationship with Christ. It's their relationship. So suddenly I feel like my time is over. It's ending. It's, it's done. Was it enough? Was I enough? Have the sins I have spilled over on them? But then I remember that God loves me. And he loves me the same way he loves John and the same way he loves Kate. And if if I have sinned, it's still in his plan. He loves them, and he will keep them in his path. So one of the things that um, I think about with the verse that Larry read is that um, God's love is selfless. But I also think about us as moms and about Mary in that moment when, she's, when Christ is on the cross. And I think about the pain that she must have experienced. It, it had to be a physical pain to watch her son be crucified. So in that moment, Christ says to her, Mom, I need you to look after him. And I think as a mom, you kind of take a deep breath and you start the new chapter and you start to look after the new pain and the new hurt and you find that new person. So I think that was one of the things I missed saying earlier is that even though you've come through a great pain, look around, see who the next person is that you can help and walk through with. Um, I would say for me, it's the fear that I'm going to somehow do something or not do something that gets in the way of my kids knowing God's love for them. Um, but I get through that just knowing the goodness of God um, and knowing that he doesn't need me to be a part of their story. He could do it without me, but he blesses me with getting that opportunity. Um, and no matter how hard I try, I couldn't screw it up even if I wanted to. So thankfully his power is greater than anything I can do wrong. Man, that's some good stuff. And one of the things, you did leave that out in the first service. What an insight. My goodness, that, that will preach right there. You know, look at, so that's really good stuff. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, one of the things, too, I, 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 I'm not mansplaining. So, but we are going to mess it up. You know, I joked around with my kids all, all a long time. Hey, you'll talk to your counselor about that when you're older. Yeah, so from for my, my perspective, but my, my goodness, that's really good stuff. Thank you so much for sharing that. Last question, and it comes out of Titus. Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 are the, is the passage. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may be revi- not be reviled. So here's the thing. We understand that's in a context, right? Everything was written in a context in Scripture, and so the context is different for us today. But the one thing that is not different is one, one of the aspects that's missing in our society is that we've put ourselves on islands. Like, we're the only ones going through something, right? And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, you see these ladies, and you've probably seen them walking in, and, you know, so so some beautiful children walking in, holding hands, and, uh, you know, grandma walking in, and her kids, you know, family with them, and grandson sitting beside her, and, you know, and uh, kids up here leading worship uh, today. It's three of the, three of, we had three kids up here, four teenagers up here leading worship today from our church, and, you know, seeing all that stuff, and, you know, all, all of that aspect, but everybody struggles, right? And everybody's going through some of the same struggles in life. And we've got to get back into a society where we understand that we're not alone. 
you know, that I'm struggling, that you're struggling, that we're all struggling. So I, I asked uh, from this verse right here, and we'll go in order of the, the ages they're representing, so Marissa will lead, is what's one piece of advice you would give a young lady um, in, the, in the generation right behind you? So. Um, most importantly, I would say that um, you need to focus on having a good, growing, strong relationship with Christ because he's going to be the one that's never going to fail you. Um, and second to that is finding a good, godly husband. Um, not only are, is that man going to be the father of your children, he's going to have a huge impact on their lives, but he's also going to support your role as a mother. Um, you're going to go through the trenches together, and there's going to be some tough times. So to have them there to support you, um, I know I wouldn't be half the mom that I am without the support of Adam. Um, and I give a lot of credit to single moms because I don't know how they could do it. Um, I can't imagine how hard that could be. Um, and then once you are, are blessed to become a mother, just lean on your support system, friends, family. We're not meant to do this alone, and we're all just figuring it out as we go. So. My mom had a saying that she attributes to her grandmother. If you watch your pennies, your dollars don't mind themselves. And I kind of apply this to our, our personal faith at, at home and to raising the kids. And I, I fall back onto two principles. Love is. And I think that we have, to, we have to grow love is. We have to grow what love is defined by the Bible. Love is patient and kind. It doesn't boast. Those are the things that the world doesn't tell us. They say if we love something, everything is accepting and good, but love is patient and kind. And once you have that down, I pinned it on my refrigerator for several years. Um, and I, at one point I would make, every time you open the refrigerator, you had to say it. So just silly things. But I kept, I kept teaching this and I keep learning it myself. And then once we had love is at least understood, we added love your neighbor. So if you have love is and love your neighbor, that's a lot of, of Christ and our biblical foundations and what we want to teach. And it's, some days it's all I can handle learning and it's all I can handle teaching. And so once my children were old enough to profess their own faith and be baptized, we stopped talking about what Paul and I's rules were. And we started talking about um, what God wanted for them and God's rules. And we started talking about the impact of fighting or lying or betraying in their relationship with Christ. So it stopped being about us. And it started about building their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so wrapping those three things up into one of the things I send them off, uh, you know, if they're leaving or they're going someplace without me, I, I say... Be good, godly kids, or be a good, godly woman, be a good, godly man. And I think just, just keeping it very simple, um, as they get sharper and sharper with their scriptures and, and teaching, they'll, they'll come back. But I think if you stay rooted in those things, um, that that's how I, I see growing Christ. My advice is to hold tightly to your faith. This world will test you. The evil one of this world will test you. We need to pray for faith to follow Jesus and not our feelings. Everything in this world and in our current day's culture says, follow your feelings. What feels right? What do you think is right? Do what feels good. But faith is not a feeling. Faith is a choice to believe in the hope that we have in God and in his son, Jesus Christ. Following our human uh, emotions, it will consistently lead us away from God, away from peace, and into sin and pain and turmoil. It's amazing to me how God watches over us in spite of our bad choices. And... We, he just waits patiently for us to realize how much we need his grace 
so that no matter how far we've wandered or what we've done, our Heavenly, Heavenly Father is waiting for us to come home and waiting for us with open arms. We need to be that way for our children because as they go out into the world, they're going to screw up. They're going to have rough times. They're going to listen to the voices of the world and make choices that are going to cause them either literally or figuratively to fall flat on their face. And they need to know that you are going to be there for them with an open door, an open arms, an open heart to say, yeah, you screwed up, or yes, you've made this choice or that choice, but I still love you no matter what. I still love you. I don't like what you're doing, but I love you. Um, I love this portion of scripture where it talks about the older women teaching the younger women actually being mentors in so many areas of life. And, you know, we, all of us mentor whether we want to or not with our lives and our words and the things that we do. And, you know, I would, this one piece of advice that I would give, if God gives you the privilege of coming alongside a woman and helping her and, and being a mentor, I would tell you this. Remember, you cannot fix that woman, but you can point that woman to the one who can fix her, and that is Jesus Christ. So, uh, ladies, thank you so much. Really, thank you for being vulnerable, for answering questions. So, let me make fun of your husband. So on a regular basis. So, uh, and uh, but no, seriously, one of the things to think through is here's what I wanted to accomplish with this. Ladies out, out here, have you went through some of these same things? Do you feel some of these same fears and doubts? Have some of these same questions and the pain that's going on from the perspective of a mom? Now, men, I know this was directed at women today, but what about you? Do you look around the room and you see a guy around the room and you think, man, he's got life altogether. Everything says straight for him. And uh, one of the things I was hoping to accomplish was, one, is to celebrate moms and to thank, just have these ladies represent all the moms in our church and say, thank you, moms, for everything you do. Uh, life would not, well, one, it wouldn't be here without you. <laughs> uh, and second, uh, life wouldn't be what it is without moms, to nurture and to care. And, you know, where dads rub dirt on it, moms give kisses. You know, and it's just an aspect of life that makes things better. And so thank you so much. But then the other aspect of this is if you're hurting, don't stay out there alone. Look around. One of these ladies, women, will talk with you. Look around at somewhere else, because odds are there's somebody sitting in the same pew of you or sitting in the same section of you that are going through the same thing. Men, don't stay in the struggle alone. Find somebody to lean into and to talk with. God has brought us together in a church, not so that we could sit in these rows and continue to do life from rows, right? See the back of people's heads and wave to them as they walk out the door, but he's brought us together so we could have those me too moments, those moments of, man, you're struggling, me too. You have fears with that? Me too. You have questions about that? Me too. Let's talk about it. Let's pray about it together. And, and that's what I was hoping, from first and foremost, that you would pick up from this, is that you got the, some of those same fears, ladies. These ladies have gone through it. There are others out there that are the same. Now reach out and reach into their lives and other people's lives to make a difference. That is why Jesus has brought us together within the body of Christ, so that we can come here, we can do life together, we can encourage one another and equip each other so that when we run out of these doors and we walk into the world, that where we know it's all messed up, man, and that we're equipped, we're loved, we're encouraged, and we can go out and attack hell with a water pistol because that's what Jesus has left us here for. But we need each other to get to that process. So let me pray for us, and then we'll be done today. Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace. Uh, God, it's overwhelming to think of the fact that you love us even in the midst that we're not perfect. Uh, and talking with these ladies, one of the things I, I, I know that they wanted to present to everyone here is that uh, there's nobody up here that's got everything all figured out. It's always a struggle and a journey, but that struggle and journey always leads us to that same place of trust and submission and surrender to your will. So, Lord, I'm thankful for them, and I just pray that for the rest of us in this room as well. If there's a sin that needs to be repented of, that we take time to do that today. If an opportunity needs to be made to make Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives, that we take time to do that today. But, Lord, more importantly, that we look around a room and we see people who are going through the same human experience that we are, with the struggles that we have, the struggles that they have. And it's not a moment of casting judgment. And it's also even a moment of saying, listen, I don't struggle with that, but here's mine. 
Here are my struggles. Here are my fears. Here are my doubts. Let's walk through this together. So, Lord, I'm thankful for today, thankful for moms, but most importantly, thankful for the grace you give us in Christ. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.